So we've talked a lot about stresses in the context of rock mechanics, and stresses are pretty much foundational to everything you're going to be doing in this field. So how do we actually find them in an in-situ environment, right? It's one thing to be able to test a, a sample in a laboratory, but what about in the real world where you can't just take every single piece of rock and test it individually? Well, it gets a bit hairier, but we do have some simplifications we can make that are tremendously helpful when looking at an in-situ environment. So within any rock in the earth, right, in two-dimensional space, we'll have two stresses, a vertical and a horizontal. Sigma V and Sigma H. And you, you might say, well, in three dimensions, of course, you might split sigma h up into sigma x and sigma y, and then sigma v would be in the z direction. But we're not going to quite go there. So we have these two stresses, okay. And horizontal stresses, we are going to kind of put on the back burner for now because those are much more, you know, they're a function of a whole lot of different things with uh, local tectonism, uh, local groundwater movement, differences in porosity, a whole bunch of stuff that might cause rocks to put extra stresses in the horizontal direction. And these things also affect stresses in the vertical direction. But in the vertical direction, we also have hydrostatics. And in the absence of these other forces that might cause extra large stresses, hydrostatics are incredibly powerful in giving us an idea of, you know, what the stress might be in the vertical direction. So I'm going to start with a little example here. Using point P that is distance H below the surface here, we can take a look at, let's say it has some little mass around it. Just imagine it as a block. Maybe not an area, you know, but a block, a point mass with some little slice of volume on top of it. We'll call that a differential volume, an infinitesimal volume, dV. And yeah, we're going to do a little bit of calculus. It's super easy, which is going to be equal to dM times or divided by what? Let's think about it. If you want volume, that's in meters cubed. And then we want to go to mass, right? So we might say that's a, to get to meters cubed, you, to get from meters cubed to kilograms, you might divide by kilograms over meters cubed. And the unit for that is density. So dm over rho, right? Okay, so we've got a differential volume and a differential mass associated with this thing. Now, what can we do with that? Well, let's think of an FBD of the rock here. If we're thinking of what's causing vertical stresses, let's start with what's causing vertical forces. So if we take a look at point P here once again, then once again, we're ignoring the horizontal direction for now. Then we might have MG in the downward direction, right? I'll call this MPG to specify that's the mass of some point of rock P. That's just the self weight though. That's not a force that's really acting. That's not a stress on that rock, is it? And you'd say, yeah, well, the only other force really acting on it. Oh, and there's going to be a normal force from the stuff below it, of course. We'll draw that down there. N for normal force. And then the stuff coming above it, which is really where we're going to get our vertical stresses from is, we'll call that F vertical. And how are we going to find that F vertical? Well, think back to this. We've got some differential mass here, and the force that's going to be exerted on this point P is just going to be the self-weight of that differential mass. So FV is going to be equal to, let me actually add that, some DFV, some differential force. It's going to be equal to dm times g, that differential mass times the force of gravity that's pulling it down. And you say, okay, so we've got a differential mass, gravity, looks like we can find this force. And you're absolutely right. The one thing we have to do is just figure out we're going to be obviously integrating to get rid of this differential. So what are we going to be integrating over? And this is, like I said, not very conceptually difficult calculus. It should be obvious we're integrating from the bottom at point P back up to the surface. So we're going to be integrating over height h. So we would say that f of v, to get that differential force into an actual force, we're going to say that's the integral from 0 to h of this. 
dmg. And now you say, okay, well, we've got an integral set up, but we're, we've got dm here and h here. We can't really plug that in. Those, those things are disagreeing. Well, this is where we have our relationship between dm and dv. We can say that this is equal to dm is just equal to rho dv. So this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to h of rho g dv. That's some volume. And now we can think of it this way. That volume, right, can be broken up. If we think of it as a little block sitting on top of sitting on top of our mass, we might say this mass has some differential height, dh, and then some differential lengths, dx and dy in those directions. But since we're just doing a column of material here, right, if we assume that point P is only supporting the column directly above it, which in undisturbed earth is an okay assumption, when we start excavating and putting in pillars and stuff like that, it kind of falls apart. But for now, that's a good assumption. And we look at this dx dy, we can just write that as dA, how about? Or even better, it doesn't even have to be differential. Maybe it's all there is. Let's just call it A. So we've got an area, and now this allows us to switch it up. This should look beautiful now. This is equal to rho g a dv, dh, excuse me. Rho g a dh, the integral from zero to h of this. Obviously we have dh and a constant, so we can bring all this stuff outside the integral of dh from 0 to h is going to be h. So we have rho g a h is our force in the vertical direction. And of course, in rock mechanics, force is not so cool. Stress is incredibly cool. So divide both sides by a. And now we have a force per unit area that is indeed a stress. So the vertical stress is going to be equal to rho g h. And that's great. You know, this is a super simple, easy formula. Obviously, going through the derivation, easy calculus, but you don't even have to do this. This is one of the easiest formulas you can remember. And intuitively, it should make sense, right? It's going to be proportional to, given a constant gravitational acceleration and a constant density of rock, right? It's going to depend exclusively on that height that you are in that rock column. And again, this, this is predicated on a couple of assumptions, so let's talk about those. In this process, we've assumed a few things, and that is, importantly, constant rho. So a constant density of the rock, you think of it in, in hydrostatics, right? That comes from water, and in a column of water, we would expect if we assume the water to be incompressible, which is usually a good assumption, then the density shouldn't change. But with rocks, then you might have a whole bunch of different types. Obviously, something like a igneous, a well-weathered igneous rock at the surface is going to be significantly less dense, probably, than a, than a metamorphic rock significantly deeper down. But if we assume constant rho, let's see if we can find an average rho somewhere maybe midway through the column, then we could assign that to be our constant row. And of course, we assume negligible, negligible contributions from outside forces, which goes back to what I was saying about there really are a huge number of things can, that can come into play when looking at stress in rocks. These are, I would call, passive forces acting on them just straight from the rock above it, and we'll assume that there's nothing going on with, you know, tectonic activity or other geologic activity that would really screw with our stress recordings. So an average density for something like sandstone, specific gravity might be around 2.65, so you can multiply that by the specific gra or the density or the specific weight, uh, you know, 62.4 pounds per square foot water, or uh, what is it, around one kilogram per whatever it is in, in metric. The height could be anything, you know, you could say that's 100 feet deep, and then gravity, of course, 32.2 feet per second squared, or 9.81 meters per second squared, 
You could use all those numbers if you want. You could definitely plug them in and you could see what you get. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I think this is pretty simple and self-explanatory, but if there's a demand, then I can also provide. But this is a great way to set us up for some actual examples where we can go through some problems that would be modeling a real world scenario where we could find our vertical stresses and then use those in situ stresses and maybe transform them along a fault line or something to help us find the actual stresses that would be important and whether a rock mass will fail along a, along a shear plane or the whole deal, right? This is all just one little piece of a, of a great big picture.